Okay, thanks so much for having me. It's really nice to be here um, and to hear about the cool hikes that you guys have done. It's really cool. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about what, what I love and what I, my studies have mostly been on and what I try in my job at Origins also to spread the word about is ochre, which are basically rocks, uh, just different types of rocks. We can, I'll have a look at some of them just now. Um, that are what pigment is made out of. So all our rock art paints that we find around the world this is the main ingredient of the most of the, the color. So it's a natural pigment, but it has a whole lot of different uses. And what I'm going to talk about, I thought since it was explorers, I kind of thought, talk about more of the use of how ochre and people in the past interacted with the landscape and with ochre in that. And looking at some recent um, archaeological archaeologists that are doing really cool research, looking at landscape use. Um, in terms of ochre and how far people were traveling in the past to collect certain raw materials. If you have questions during the talk, please do ask. I don't, I don't mind at all. Okay, so let me just see if I can change the slide. What do I need to do? Here we go. Okay, so I have explained what ochre is. A lot of people um, are uncertain how to say it, ochre, or what, what is it? But it is the rock in the, the bottom right corner. Um, but it's a whole lot of different types of rocks. So it stands for, I mean, it's um, a range, pretty much most of the rocks are iron rich. So the main ingredient, which what gives it its color is the iron, uh, but it's a range of rocks. So from really soft shales to mudstones to hard hematites, and um, it all kind of falls under the umbrella of ochre in, in the archaeological assemblage. Um, and, and often any color, so any rock that can give any color is just put into the oak category. Uh, but it's the main ingredients are iron oxide, so hematites or agurtite if it's if it's the yellow varieties. But a wide range of colors, but mostly with in the, the yellows, oranges, and reds, you get a few. Um, I haven't found any in, in South Africa, but you get some really beautiful vivianites, which are iron phosphates, which are the beautiful blues, uh, which are mostly for, from organic materials. But why does it matter? Why do we actually care about this rock that we think of? May, okay, there people made paint in the past, but it's quite a lot more complicated than that. Uh, so we know it was collected and used in the ancient past. So at the time when, so before Homo sapiens as well, but at the time when Homo sapiens are becoming modern, when we were, our skeletons were, were modern already, but there's lots of debate as to um, what were our, our cognitive abilities. And that's a time when you find ochre being used. And the, you find a lot of red ochre being preferred, even though you find a lot of yellows and oranges and things, um, which has made people think, okay, it must be symbolic. You know, red is this powerful color that is love and passion and death or blood. And so a lot of symbolism has been attached to that, that people were using this, this red color. Uh, we find the world's oldest art. So that picture there of the Blombos engraved ochre. Um, has been termed the world's oldest art at about 77,000 years ago. Uh, it doesn't have any functional use. It wouldn't have been to sharpen a tool or uh, make powder, but you can see definite engravings on the ochre. Uh, we also find ochre that has been used that it's kind of formed a crayon. So I think people are thinking maybe there's rock art. If they were directly using ochre on a rock surface. We don't find any rock art yet. At the time when we're looking at um, early Homo sapiens, we know that it was transported vast distances across the landscape. Um, and we know that ochre is still used now. It's still used widely around the world in many, many different ways. And I'll get into that as well. Um, so what is it about ochre that, that humans are, are so attracted to? Oh, wait, let me, oops. Oh, my one section isn't coming up there, but it doesn't matter. So, but in color, in, in archaeology, um, there's a lot that we don't see, a lot that isn't preserved. And, you know, most things in, in an archaeological site are, are brown and you've got lots of different brown layers and, you know, black from fires and things. And having this red of ochre is so um, distinct. You know, why were people collecting these, these rocks? Uh, but there's a lot that, that might not have been preserved. So we, we find the, the red ochre, but are we going to find, you know, we wouldn't find berries. Maybe people were using blue pigments that are organic and we don't find them. And um, yeah, so what I'm going to talk a little bit about is these, these 
ochre journeys that people were making 100,000 years ago, but also the ochre journeys that archaeologists are making now to understand how ochre was used in the past. So first, Starting off with some just a historic and ethnographic understanding of ochre use. So there are still there are many accounts of so traveler accounts and ethnographic accounts of ochre being used by different hunter-gatherer groups, and that it was used in ceremonies or rubbed on skin or certain sometimes rubbed on hair. Um, these images here are from a beautiful book um, of Virgil's drawings. Um, where he's described these two individuals, that's a, a lady on the, the left and a man on the right. Um, I can't say their names properly. But um, but where they had ochre just on the top of it, there's actually hair. They're not wearing a hat or anything, but the ochre paste was on top of the hair. And um, so they know that they would use it during certain rituals, coming of age rit rituals and things like that, but that they also mixed it, different groups would mix it with um, euphorbic milk or different ingredients to actually make, make a kind of glue. So, in a lot of the understanding of how people use it now has kind of helped inform archaeologists as to how it might have been used in the past. So, kind of looking at these uses now, it's not just a pigment. Then uh, you might have seen a lot of um, images like this of uh, the Himba woman in Namibia or um, in, in the Maasai in Kenya, maybe, um, who cover their bodies in an ochre paste, often mixed with, with clarified butter or animal fat, and they cover their hair, their bodies, their jewelry, everything in this um, ochre paste. Red ochre, most, uh, nearly always red. Um, and that's for ritual, but it also has another use as a sunscreen. And the, the Himba actually have uh, one of, they have a really, really low skin cancer rate uh, throughout Africa, and it's thought that ochre might actually be one of the reasons for that as well. So it is actually a, a really useful ingredient for that. I'll get into a little bit that, uh, about that a bit more later. Um, but it also has antibacterial properties. It can actually use to, be used to stop the decay process and hides. Um, it's antifungal as well. And you can buy those, those big balls like that. You can buy them from beauty shops or markets around South Africa. And it's a beautiful kaolinite clay uh, with iron in it. Uh, that are used for healer training and also for sunscreen. So a nice, um, cheaper form of sunscreen. Um, but it is used as medicinally uh, on wounds, uh, externally, but also can be eaten Um So it's got a whole lot of uses that when we're thinking of how it's used in the past, looking at early human use of ochre, we can't just assume it was used because it was red and for paint, because most of the uses ethnographically are the red varieties. Um, but it's for other uses, not only for its color. Um, oh, and then I put this picture of the, the vulture in as well, because it's quite interesting. Some uh, some vultures and some elephants as well uh, actually habitually bathe in ochre mud. And there's a lot of debate about why and research done on it as to whether they, they instinctively know it has this antibacterial There are properties and it could help get rid of ink in vultures that it might actually be something about um, display. That, you know, not that it's, it's not necessarily the men that do it more, but it could be a display thing where the, the color is something that's, um, that's important to them. So it's quite interesting. It's not, not only humans that are, for some reason, attracted to this iron rich object. Um, and then uh, one, one thing that I also wanted to mention, thinking about eating soils as well. So we don't think of ochre mm -hmm. as, as a food, but there is uh, people that do eat soils that crave chalk or crave um, certain uh, soils when they're pregnant, maybe, or when they're deficient in certain um, other minerals. And ochre is one of those that you can buy at markets as well. You can buy pieces like this uh, that are more chalky, uh, that they have um, that are sold purely to be eaten, um, and this is have something that happens around the world in you know the Americas and um, and all over Africa as well. You find used for different reasons or uh, importance attached to soil. That it's you know the soil like in in Central America here the picture on the left is Tierra Santa and it's you know it's holy sand you know and uh, we do attach a lot of meaning to soils and to rocks. Uh, but can we, can, can, how sure can we be that people thought that in the ancient past? Then uh, something that, that we might have all seen is people using ochre to color their, their homes. 
uh, or different kind of iron rich soils or to color pottery. Um, and that's something that we see all around around South Africa. And um, also in Australia, there's still a thriving rock art uh, tradition um, and art tradition using ochre and using natural ochres. And um, I just put in here Heidi Gustafson on the, the, the pictures on the right, and she's kind of been termed the ochre whisperer. Uh, she's just released an awesome new book called Book of Earth. And uh, she uh, looks at, she's kind of brought together a whole lot of ochre studies looking at how people interact with Earth. Um, and so, yeah, it's just the, the last point on ethnographic um, and linguistic terminology is that when you're looking back in archaeology, it's often really difficult to know. You don't know. You have little pieces of evidence. How were people using ochre in the past? How were they viewing this object? Especially when you're dealing with humans that we don't actually know were human and were thinking in the same way as us. Um, and so when we use these ethnographic analogies, we've got to be very cautious that we know Obviously, these are, are now are modern uses and modern humans using ochre, uh, but it can help inform how we approach our studies in ochre um, and understand it. And this is just an example of some of the, the terms that are used to describe ochre um, around, around the country mostly. Um, and it's still something that is still widely used. And I'll, when, I, when I do workshops with ochre, I'll often have people saying, oh, we call it this and we call it this. And it's, it's, it's quite cool that it is this object that for some reason humans have been using for 100,000 years. Um, and then just some beautiful pictures of rock art from around Africa. So these are, are mostly, ochre is the main ingredient in all of these. Um, whether it's, you know, rock art that, that goes back to, to 20,000 years, some of the, the pieces. These are some in Africa and Namibia. So this is the oldest piece of, of rock art that has been dated in Southern Africa, dated to 27,000, the, the slab on the, the top right. And the only reason a lot of the rock art we can't date, just for interest's sake, because of the, there isn't ma uh, material in it that can actually be dated. So this, this piece, fortunately for us, had fallen off into the sediment, and then they could date the sediment around it. So it's not actually the rock art that they're dating, but they know the sediment uh, that can date from that. So it's about 27,000 years old. Um, and this is a piece from, um, a picture from Game Pass in the Drakensberg. And I just thought this is a really beautiful one. That it's a little bit hard to see on the screen maybe, but you can actually see the paint. You can see the brush strokes in the paint. And there's a lot of um, research done more, more recently on trying to date rock art paint and trying to understand the ingredients in, um, in rock art paint. But that's just a little aside. Um, and, and then also just that there's a huge a widespread use of ochre across continents and through time. So even the, in the Roman and classical period, you had miltos and it was red was this, this powerful um, ingredient. There would have been other, um, other uh, pigments that were used as well, like cinnabar and things. Uh, but ochre is one that is just consistently used around the world because it's so widely available. You can pick it up all over Joburg. I, whenever I go anywhere, I'm always trying to find ochre, and I usually do find some variety of it. Um, but it's used in burials still, and in ancient burials, and in more recent burials, um, and, and, and all around the world. So then getting more into to my research is looking at some of the earliest uh, uses of ochre. Um, and so just to get an idea, the, the earliest evidence that you find is around 500,000 years ago. Uh, that you find people connecting with them. You find pieces being brought back. They don't naturally occur in these shelters, uh, but they're brought back to sites um, for some reason. Sometimes used a little bit, sometimes not. There's less evidence in, in Europe, but most of the evidence is, evidence is coming from Africa about 500 to 300,000 years ago. But then um, from about 150,000 years ago, and especially after 100,000 years ago, you're finding a lot of ochre suddenly being being used in different ways. We know they were grinding it. We know they were, they were pulverizing it. Why, why were people using it? So, yeah, I can't see it there. But so mostly after about 100,000 years ago is when, you, when you're finding a huge amount of ochre pieces. Some archaeological sites have 10,000 pieces. Um, and <clears throat> through not, not very many layers through time, um, you have residues of the, we know that they were processing the powder, you're finding it on the stone tools, you're finding patches of ochre that they kind of had a work surface with ochre, you're finding uh, paints being made, the, the, the Palamon shells there on the bottom left, 
are found at Gombos Cave as well, um, and it's mixed with seal fat and charcoal to make some kind of paint in a container. And those are dated to 100,000 years ago. Uh, so we're finding a lot of evidence that ochre was, was being used in different ways, was being used with different objects. Um, and just to give an idea of some Middle Stone Age sites, uh, there's a lot of Middle Stone Age sites around South Africa. So the Middle Stone Age is roughly between 30,000 years and, and 300,000 years. So it's a very long, long period. Uh, but there's sites all around S Southern Africa. And going up into Africa, South Africa has just been really well studied or better studied than a lot of regions in Africa and other countries in Africa. Um, these are some sites. I don't know if, how many archaeological sites you guys have been to. Lots of these sites are quite hard to get to. Uh, this is the, the top one is Blombos Cave, which is just near Spilby. Um, and it's now it's it's quite covered up. It's on private land. It is hard to get to. Um, and Clip Drift as well is just a little bit up the coast in the same area. And it's Chris Central which who excavates there. Then Classy's River, um, which is nearby, right near Classy's River. And um, also a beautiful set of caves with an amazing amount of archaeological evidence. We've also got human remains there as well. Uh, then Pinnacle Point, which is a really nice um, site that you can visit, um, where it's just under a big golf course. Um, and Sabudu Cave, which is where, as I was mentioning, I, I did my, my PhD research at Sabudu um, in KwaZulu Natal, near kind of inland from Belito, near Verulam. Um, and these sites, you can see they, they're well-chosen sites. You don't have a lot of uh, like deep caves. I mean, in, in the cradle, yes, but deep livable caves. Uh, like in, in Europe, we, we have shelters. And so a lot of our rock art and a lot of our sites are in these shelters. There would have been a lot of archaeological sites around the landscape that are just not preserved or we just wouldn't be able to find them now. Um, but we find evidence in these in these beautiful shelters that are now prime property right at the coast, but the sea line would have moved sometimes 20 kilometers over, over time as you go between glacial and interglacial periods, the, the sea wouldn't have always been as close. Um, then the, the oldest ochre mine known in the world is in, in Eswatini, and it's dated to, to about 43,000 years ago. So now it, it was a commercial mine, it's not used anymore in Gwenya mine. And it's um, so it was used for iron ore to get iron. Uh, but there's a, a cave, um, we'll take a walk up there. So a beautiful, beautiful landscape. And then the cave just right at the top of the mine is called Lion Cavern. And that's where there's evidence of people who find stone tools and they've been able to, to date the, the site and the, um, the archaeological evidence at the site. To about to over forty thousand years ago, so we know people were processing and getting a lot of this ochre. And again, it's red; it's the red iron-rich ochre. Uh, so that's that's the site. Um, but and although you're finding a lot of red ochre, and that's the main um, iron oxide that you're finding, you also find a lot of colours if you're looking for. But what again? What we're finding in the archaeology is this this uh, attraction or this main use of red ochre. Cool. So that's a view just from the site. Um, and it's a team uh, from Tübingen in Germany, Gregor Bader, um, who's, who's leading the excavations at the site, um, and a whole um, bunch of, of different researchers that are involved in different aspects. But it's a beautiful landscape, and I, I don't know if any of you have been to the site, but it's, it's really beautiful to, to see. Um, and then, so what's, what's important in a lot of this is looking at, we know people were collecting a lot of the ochre, but how, where were they collecting it from? It's been a lot of the discussions in generally in archaeological studies. So you can understand the site, understand how people were living there, what animals they were there with animals they were eating and catching, but what's, how were they moving around the landscape? Were people at this time communicating with each other? You know, what kind of uh, change was there across, across the landscape? What kind of communication? What kind of social grouping, if anything? And so ochre comes into that because it is seen as the symbolic object um, that might have been used for social marking or might have been used um, as, as a different object. We don't know. Um, so I'm just going to ch chat about some of the, um, the research that's been going on looking at landscapes. Uh, so this is also in Eswatini. 
Um, so quite near to, to Nguenya mine, just road cutting. And I'm always stopping now at that road cutting. It's all around uh, whenever I travel anywhere uh, because you find beautiful ochre uh, or shale, especially, um, you know, kind of ridges uh, where you just get these beautiful sediments of different color shales and, and ochres. And uh, here I with a, a, a whole bunch of, of ochre researchers and um, people looking at um, sourcing ochre and finding out how, how ochre moved around the landscape. And the cool thing with this site is that you can still see, um, yeah, just that picture on the bottom left, you can see these markings and there's actually tools still there where um, in Swati rituals, they still, especially wedding uh, during weddings, the, the bride-to-be is actually part, ochre is part of the, the ceremony to, um, to kind of initiate her to being a bride and to being a wife. And so it's still used widely around the country and you can still see the implement that actually scrape the ochre out of the just a, a stick. Um, so it's, it's very cool to, to see it. You kind of think as an archaeologist, you often remove yourself from, from how people, you know, to put your people, put yourself in, you know, how people were living 80,000 years ago or something and realize that there's still so many similarities between how, how we use our landscape and so many huge differences in how far removed we are from nature. Uh, so this is Blombos again. Um, so there's been a really a, a lot of research done. There's um, uh, a team of researchers, Brandy McDonald and Beth Veliki, that are doing a lot of sourcing studies, understanding why there was so much ochre at Blombo specifically. It's kind of the mecca of, of ochre site in, in South Africa and in the world, actually. You're finding most of the oldest evidence drawing. The little uh, fragment over there has ochre drawings on it, then the engraved piece, and then the, the shells with the ochre paint and and thousands of ochre pieces of the site so there's a lot of questions as to where where they're getting the ochre from there's no known ochre source nearby it might be now under the under the sea or the ocean um so maybe when the, when the sea recedes again then we'll be able to find an ochre source but we don't actually know where they're getting the ochre from why were they bringing so much back to the site and but we know that ochre was was valued it was used for these special oh, yeah. objects that don't seem to have a functional uh, purpose necessary. Um, and so uh, their research is looking at these sources, going, you know, traveling around um, the area and traveling around the Western Cape to look at, to get the chemical signatures for different ochre sources around to see if was this exactly where people, were they traveling 50 kilometers to get their ochre because it was that precious? Was it perhaps being traded in some way? Um, so these are um, a, a lot of the research that they're looking at. Um, and when I went on a an ochre sourcing study, that uh, the lady in the picture there is Lydia Pin, who's doing a or Pine, who's doing a, a study on or writing a book on on ochre use around the world, um, which I'm excited to to read hopefully soon. Um, but what we found when we were just kind of driving along, we just stopped at most of these these spots that you can see along the road, and the all of the pieces that we found didn't visually at least look like they weren't the same kind of raw material as the, the Blombos oak that you find uh, that's engraved. Um, and so we, we still don't know, and, I, and I'm excited to see how the research comes out, but where were they actually collecting the ochre? How were people at Blombos using the, the landscape? Yeah, were they traveling really far to try and get the ochre? Um, then just around bits, I mean, we've got this um, amazing resource just here. We've got beautiful shales. Might not be this bright, bright red that you find, but you, if you just across from bits, if you're traveling up Jan Smuts, there's a big Yelan statue by the entrance of bits going into Bramfontein. And um, there's beautiful road cutting that you can see uh, this really, this nice banded ironstone kind of because of the Freer de Fort dome impact kind of crumpled everything up. So you can see this beautiful banded impact and it's all skewed. Um, and you have these beautiful layers of white and red, yellow and red shales. And in between it, these banded ironstones that are often magnetic. So you can see the geology so nicely. Um, and this is my, my son helping me bash it out of the wall because it's fun. Um, and but, it, but it's really cool that we have this ochre around us everywhere. And... In the, the, the one source, and onion smuts, you can actually see where people have dug it out. And I've never been able to 
find somebody doing it and asking them, you know, what they're doing it, what they are doing it for, why are they collecting it? But we know it is actually still being actively collected there. Um, and then I had a, an interesting a conversation with, with Heidi Gustafson uh, recently, the Oka Whisperer, um, and she said that um, it's quite interesting to think of the plants that grow with the geology. Because you have these plants, I mean, this is a, um, just a blue gum. And, but to see these, the plants that naturally will grow or are attracted to certain kinds of soils or certain kinds of geology, and she said it's a, it's a, it can be a really nice indicator of what substances actually mix, mix well together. So if you're looking at making natural pigments or making paint, mixing ochre, so these shales, this, this tree growing out of the shales, and using the, the resin or the gum or the sap from those same plants, they actually make a really, they bond really well together. So it's quite interesting. I think we often think, oh, the tree's just growing there, and especially if it's a, a foreign tree that is, has been brought into a space. Uh, but it's quite interesting to, to think about it, how nat na nature is telling us that certain things actually work together. Um, and then in Limpopo, there's an amazing around, amount of, of sites that are being researched. There's a lot of exciting research being done in the area. This is Uli Bumsput, uh with Aurora Val, who's in um, France and Portugal. And she's been in Germany all around. Uh, this picture at the bottom, you actually can't see it. It's the, the rock surface of the, the site is just covered in this red. So we don't know if it actually is ochre that people were just kind of painting the whole surface. Um, so it's quite exciting to... Research is hopefully going to be done on that. Uh, but what you find, and I have a few examples here, which you can't see now, but is you find these beautiful, shiny specularites. So it's another variety, which is really hard. And you can get the beautiful purples. You can see the lines just at the bottom there. It's beautiful purples and kind of ready purples that are shiny. It's like eyeshadow. They, they're fatty. They're so beautiful. And um, you just find them lying all around. And this was part of um, my master's student uh, who's finished now. She was looking at um, where we're finding, where the ochre from, is from and trying to find a source for these ochres in the area. We can see that there's, there's paintings at the site as well. Um, and then this is the site also in, in Limpopo. This is near the Makatan Valley, the world, in the World Heritage Site. And it's, this is called Mulu's Cave. And it's Paloma de la Peña, who's um, in Spain. And she's, again, a Middle Stone Age site. So all of these are Middle Stone Age sites. So dated, you know, between, mostly between 50 and 100,000 years ago, roughly. Um, so around that time, you know, when are humans becoming human? And the site itself is just situated just over there on the, the ridge on the other side. Um, and we were, again, researching for this ochre with another ochre researcher, uh, Guillaume Moran. And we were looking for where they were finding the ochre. Where is this specific type of ochre? Were they traveling really far to get it? Was it in the cave walls? And we searched all around. We found some beautiful shales, like lots of different color shales, these dark red shales and purple shales and yellows. But we, again, didn't find the, the same kind of rock that they were using at the site. So people really seem to have been selectively choosing certain types of ochre. Um, and then, so looking at these types of ochre that they were choosing, we look very closely at how they were processed. So looking at different ways that we can kind of get an idea of how people were using it. So grinding, it might seem very obvious, but uh, grinding it, so just taking a piece of ochre and abrading it against a nice rough stone. So to get, and it's the easiest way to create powder usually and a nice fine powder. Then rubbing pieces, so if it's a softer piece, maybe rubbing it directly on the skin or directly on hide to color it. Or, or the, the two to mixed together, grinding a piece and then rubbing it so you have a nice softer surface and then putting it on your skin. Then scoring or engraving it, so either making a design in a piece or using a stone tool to actually get powder off. And all of these things that might not seem that important, you think, oh, well, the main aim was to just get powder anyway, but we don't know that. We don't, we, you know, we know that they were processing ochre, but how did it function and why were they selecting certain Types where they select selecting certain types to use in a certain way for certain things. Uh, where they're crushing a lot of pieces and, and percussing a lot of pieces, and then we don't have the evidence. Maybe all the red pieces are left behind, but the yellow pieces is actually what they wanted. And those were all crushed, and we don't see. So, we, I mean, that's <coughs> unlikely, but 
Um, but we do have to kind of think of, you know, ways that it was used and why maybe they were using it. And what's been very cool in archaeological studies for that, and which, what, which I've really enjoyed, and I think in, in all archaeological studies, is experimental understanding of how, how materials are used. So you go and collect the ochre from various sources and try to replicate what you're finding in the archaeology, whether it's making a stone tool or crafting a stone tool onto a handle or using ochre in different ways. Um, and so looking at the different types of evidence you get of residues on stone tools, so trying to use the stone tool to scrape the ochre um, or yeah, finding the powder and mixing the powder and go, okay, make, making a nice paint and go, is that nice on your skin? Like just simply going, does it actually work on your skin? Does it work as a sunscreen? Things like that. Um, yeah, and I just want to quickly just go through some of those things, but to keep in mind that most of my research is based in the Middle Stone Age and around the time when we still don't know if humans are human. So some of the evidence that we have, or if they probably modern, um, they, we know that they have quite fancy stone and bone, bone tool technology as well. So they're making very sophisticated stone tools. They're most likely hafting them, so putting them onto handles to make spears or arrows, um, and using bone tools as well, which are quite, quite difficult to make. We're also finding engraved ostrich eggshells. So we're finding some engraved ochre, so definite designs, but also engraved ostrich eggshell. We're finding a wide range of uses of plant materials. So the first evidence of cooking um, in, for, in different ways, using different starchy foods for cooking. We're finding plant bedding where they've actually used insecticidal leaves in the, in the, in the, the, the sedges. Uh, so they were actually putting insecticidal leaves and then burning as, and it seems to be as part of site maintenance. So people were coming back to sites, they were using a very organized use of space where the, you know, kind of fireplace would be in a certain place in the site and we can see these different activity areas. So it does seem that people were pretty aware of their environment. They knew how to use a whole range of resources and they were, we find a few incidences of deliberate burials and collection of crystals and special items. And so a, a lot of the evidence is pointing towards that, that humans at that time, at around 100,000 years ago and coming towards um, us now, is that, that humans most likely had cognitive abilities very similar to ours. Um, and then, so then just some of the, just yeah, so some of the experimental studies to understand it, I think these are, these are always fun, so I just thought I'd, I'd bring it in here quickly. Um, is looking at half things. So we find the evidence of the, the residues on little stone tools. We find um, resin mixed with ochre. And a lot of the discussion is, you know, was ochre added because it maybe blessed the hunt or it symbolized blood or something like that because of this beautiful red that's added to it. But maybe it actually makes a good glue. And so there's been studies to, to see if okay, adding ochre to the, the resin actually helps the, the chemical process and helps to make the nice stronger glue. Um, and there's been different studies that have shown that the red ochre is actually more successful than the yellow ochre. Uh, but there's a lot of different processes that have to be followed in terms of changing the pH and heat and things. But it's a pretty, pretty sophisticated process. So anyway, we know that people were able to manipulate a lot of different uh, resin and heat and have everything ready to manipulate all at the same time, which shows quite advanced cognitive abilities as well, in terms of working memory and um, uh, fluid thinking and forward planning as well. Um, then also high tanning, which I mentioned briefly, is that ochre has antibacterial properties, and it actually stops the, the, the decay process, so it actually results in a softer hide. And again, the red ochre uh, is better for this than a lot of the yellow oak. So there might have been a reason that, that red ochre was actually used for high tanning to actually process them. Oops, get all the things up there. Uh, then sunscreen. So I mentioned the, the Himba in Namibia. Uh, this is uh, some great research done by Rian Rifkin, um, who worked with uh, the Himba. Um, and he found that, yeah, so the red iron oxide rich uh, ochre is much more effective as a sunscreen than, than yellow ochre. And I mean, it has an SPF of, I think it's about 15, so it's not you know, compared to our sunscreens now, but it's, it, it's a, a really effective barrier on your skin if you don't have anything else. And 
So thinking of how people would have need to travel very long distances in the past, especially as landscapes changed and you might have had scarce resources, they would have had to travel far distances. And so to actually have skin covering or have something that can protect you from mosquitoes or uh, yeah, malaria, things like that, it would have, it could have actually been something that is quite important um, in the past. Um, he did find he had a, a, um, the mosquito repellent studies that he did. He had a, a subject that to shove her arm into a cage with mosquitoes and different ingredients, different ochre mixtures. And um, they found that it was it wasn't a great mosquito repellent, but it still acts as a barrier on your skin. So it could be something as people were moving through malaria areas might have actually been quite important. That, you know, you wouldn't have your whole family wouldn't have died. You know, if if you actually had some kind of skin covering. But how can we prove this in the past? I mean, that's that's the hard thing. We know lots of ochre was used, and it could have been used in this way, but we don't have evidence of people putting it on their skin. Um, and then another thing is ochre powder, as, a, as using it as a polishing abrasive. So it's still used as jeweler's rouge, jeweler's rouge, that it's used to polish gold jewelry. You can just buy little tubs of it, and it's basically just a very fine iron oxide powder. Um, and we often find in around Europe and, and Africa, you find beads that have the, the, the red, the little hole in the bead is where you're finding the red ochre mostly. Um, and you might find it in other places, but the red hole a lot. So there's been lots of discussions. Was it maybe on the thread that the, that went through the hole? Um, or maybe in the polishing process, ochre was used. It wasn't actually meant to color the bead, but it was used to polish the bead. Um, and the, the result is that you get the red just in the hole. Um, but it was found that ochre is actually found, it, it, it can be a very successful polishing agent, especially for the final product to get a really nice, nice polish. So we, we kind of, you see the archaeological evidence and go, oh, they were coloring their beads. Of course, you know, everyone was covered in red and all their, everything was red, but it might have actually just been this useful ingredient or useful tool to, to make really nice polished beads. Um, and then, yeah, another thing is that, that ochre is, uh, it, it transforms, the yellow ochre transforms to red ochre when it is heated, so above 250 degrees. The iron oxyhydroxide dehydrates and it forms iron oxide. And so you don't get the, like, it's not always this very neat from yellow to red. You could get varieties of it. Um, but there's thinking that possibly the reason why we're finding so much red ochre in the archaeological record is because it was heated by fires that were built on top when people came back, they came into the site and eventually the layers were covered over and they were building fires on top. And maybe that's why we're finding so much red. So there's been studies looking at can we identify when ochre has been heated to really high temperatures so that we'll know it's under a fire. Um, and it's there's still uh, studies are still on, ongoing and looking at, at different chemicals and manganese how it forms. But we do know that at that time, so from from uh, 120,000 years ago, that uh, Homo sapiens were heating silkcrete to make stone tools, and they were heating it before they made the stone tool. Under a fire, that if, that's, if you heat it in the fire, it just burns and often cracks. So they were heating it under, under the fire to get to high temperatures to transform it into a better raw material that you can make a nicer stone tool. You can nap it easier and you can get a really nice sharp edge. So we know that they, or we can't put them all into one group, but you know that people in the Middle Stone Age potentially had the ability to understand that transformative process or the transformative power of, of heat. And so maybe they were heating ochres <clears throat> to get the kind of varieties that they wanted. Um, so that's something that's that's also being looked at. Um, so kind of taking all of this evidence together um, and looking at how ochre is used in the past and how it is still used today, um, I think it's, uh, yeah, there's a, a lot of us ochre research, and I think it's, it's this amazing item that's kind of very unassuming. It's just this piece of red rock that you can find all over the world and, uh, but it has a huge amount of uses. And so in my job, that's something that I, I kind of, as the, the curator at Origins, that I, I kind of hope um, it's, it's a nice kind of thread, red thread that goes through all the way from when we become human uh, to the earliest art form and the earliest rock art that you're finding, um, this red ochre especially, but you're finding ochre is being used in so many different ways. 
Um, and so in my uh, job at Origins, I started doing OCA workshops so like with, with adults and kids, lots of school groups that come through uh, that they can, you know, just get an idea that, wow, there's rocks all around you and you can just crush them up and make your own paint. You don't have to go to a shop to make to make paint and to experiment with different binders and so mixing it. So as we know from rock art paint and mixing it with egg or honey or, uh, you know, different different things that you can try and make paint and you can see. How, how easy it is to make a rudimentary form of paint, but how skilled rock art painters were as well in terms of making paint that could last 20,000 years and, and, and trying different ways of actually getting the paint onto a rock or onto a page um, that it's not as easy as it looks. We might not appreciate it uh, as much as we should. Um, and then also, I uh, just wanted to quickly mention, um, there's a really nice organization, so for anyone that is um, interested in getting involved in natural pigments, it's an organization that um, has artists and archaeologists and ochre foragers and anyone that's working with natural pigments called Pigments Revealed International. Um, and uh, yeah, it's from all over the world, just people that uh, are wanting to, to learn about pigments. And so it's a really nice community. Um, that I'd encourage you to go and have a look at if you are interested in this kind of thing and just amazing people that know so much and you realize how people is a woman in, in London who makes uh, paint out of found objects around London. So she kind of transformed a, a, a Vespa, just different metals from the Vespa, rusting different metals and copper and, and she transformed that into pigments, so the colors of London. Or, so it's, it's very cool. There's, there's color all around us and different ways of making color and then yeah for you explorer types i also thought i'd uh, just put this out there so we um so opening a or kind of starting a, a rock a rock and coloring materials database called the suica which is is rock in superdity and looking at um, a way of kind of bringing resources together so for mostly focusing on archaeological sites, but archaeologists that have worked on different raw materials, that it's often you go on these sourcing trips to try and find where are they getting their silkrete or where are they getting this certain type of ochre. And then once you've done your research, you've published it, then those rocks or, or, or samples that you have in your for the study just sit on your bookshelf or somewhere in a box. And so to rather have it that you can can kind of share the information more and you don't have to have someone that has to go back to to source the, the same type of, of rock that you're looking for. Um, and just to kind of share that information and have the space that archaeologists that are working with different lithic raw materials can have a space online and um, earn their physical archive. Um, so if you are doing any trips, you can bring rocks to me. So <laughs> we'll, we'll like them. Uh, yeah, but thank you for having me. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Right. So first of all, oh yay! Yeah. 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 And it's red. Well, and it's red, <laughs> but it has had to be red. Oh, cool. Oh, nice. Yes, yes, yes. Can we'll we'll do the questions now. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Do the do our questions. Okay, so um, you know, for so many of us as part of the explorers, I think coming to the caves in the Drakensberg, or even Sadiba for that matter, with the uh, Bushman paintings. Well, is Bushman the right word? What's the more technical so, term these days? In South Africa, Bushman has had a lot of uh, derogatory connotations. You know? yes. so, so we use the term San or San in the museum, okay. uh, but in, in the Kalahari and Namibia and Botswana, most uh, descendant groups still use it. Interesting. Okay, so yeah, it's so cool to to have the context of today's talk in in that sort of much wider and more detailed scope. So thank you very much, Ooh. guys. Any questions? Let's start with our audience here, yeah. and then we'll jump yeah. online. I'm afraid we're going to skip the questions. Never, <laughs> Mariam. For you, we would never. I was wanting to do like press the right button and you had a small rock in one hand, rock in storage. Um, and I thought you know, monkey is a curious thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
just need to let you. So for our online audience, the question was, you know, is there any, any evidence of sort of primates or other animals using okay, well, uh, rocks in yeah. their... And yeah, rocks, yeah. yes. So there have been chimps and bonobos that have been taught to make stone tools um, <coughs> and to speak rudimentary. So, but I haven't actually heard any, yeah, I haven't heard about okra. It's actually, it's quite an interesting thing to look into because you kind of, the animals that you care are vultures and the, the bearded vulture and it's not certain elephants. But, um, well, I haven't actually thought of okra. You kind of wonder. Um, visually as well, you know, would they pick up that red? You know, would that be part of it? Like, if you break it open, often the color of the rock on the outside looks different from the inside, and that, that's kind of this thing of breaking it open and it's red. Would that be, be anything in their eyes? I'm not sure how different like, yeah. Perhaps uh, a new PhD? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, So is there any evidence that um, ochre was used as a trade currency or as currency in trade? Not that I know. I think, so a lot of ochre research is focused on the Middle Stone Age. But suddenly where you're finding all of the evidence, so much ochre being used and it's, oh, it's exciting because we were becoming new. And then going into the later Stone Age and the Iron Age, it's kind of, it's kind of just assumed that ochre was there. And so there hasn't been a huge amount of ochre studies that focus on that. So looking at whether it was faded. In the Middle Stone Age, possibly, and then maybe that's why you're finding ochre from faraway sources. Maybe it was groups that were trading, you know, certain types of ochre things, something special. It would be hard to know whether it was people traveling or items still traded. But it's something that could be, yeah, more looked at in, yeah, in the, in the last 10,000 years. We have a lot more other evidence of items being traded to um, understand and, and ochre networks then possibly just need to have more research done. Guys, anybody else? We'll do one or two more here and then we'll go into our online audience. Great. Yeah. Okay, in death rituals. Ah, in yeah. death rituals. Death rituals. Yeah, so it's still today you'll have some communities that will still sprinkle ochre, uh, or partially because of its antifungal properties as well, but because of the year. And so you'll find burials in the last 30,000 years in, in Europe as well that have ochre pieces and ochre pellets sprinkled on <laughs> Okay, last question here. People travel so this to get the health of my people down to the perspective of functionality versus mystical properties. And we like to share it. I mean, where does it where does it fit? Yeah, and, and just, just quickly that's for that. Sorry, sorry. Um, so how would we uh, translate that? <laughs> where, so where does Oka sit as a sort of spiritual versus practical tool? Yeah. And I think that's that's exactly the, the question, is that because it has so many uses, we've got to be careful with how we interpret it in the in archaeological context. So where do I sit? I mean, it is so visually, its obvious um, attribute is that it's just visually awesome. You know, it's red, it would have been so distinctive on the landscape, and especially varieties that are shiny, and they are kind of magical. So you do, you do think okay, that 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 must have been part of the appeal, um, but because it was used in so many different ways and processed in different ways, and you're finding it with a lot of different archaeological objects, um, yeah, maybe that was a part of it as well. So I'm yeah, I'm going to have to sit on the fence. <laughs> that one. Maybe a case of I think it's going to be both. Yeah, as opposed to all. Yeah. Right, Lewis. Uh, from your side, any any questions? No, there weren't any, weren't any questions on our side. Uh, Lisa just said, you know, very, very interesting. I've been to Nguenia many years ago. I knew there was mining activity, but had no idea about the ochre. I'd be, I'll be looking with fresh eyes at road cuttings and rocks. Thank you very much. Cool. Good. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. All right, guys, in that case, yeah, a question? Yes. Yeah. Our yeah, queen. So, <laughs> what do you know when you stayed or what? 
what is the base finding? What, what is the base? What, what do you hope to make with? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think if you're making a proper paint, there's a whole process and you've got to soak it in water and strain it. And, you know, if you're getting a really nice paint, but it, with me, that often it's school groups that have about 45 minutes and there's 200 kids and it can be crazy sometimes. But um, we, once you've processed the, the pigment and you have the powder, we often use egg and honey. Those are the two that are just easy to get. And I find egg much better than honey. Honey, it often dries and it's still sticky. You get a really nice paint, but it's still sticky. Uh, whereas if you add egg, it often it just it kind of even has a nice shine when it dries. Well, I, so usually it's it's the white. So that and in in rock art, I think it's the white that's used. Um, but yeah, I just use it. <laughs> and it works nicely. And of course, there's the urban legend of using blood. Yes, I have a lot of kids. Can we use our blood? No, 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 please don't. I've spit every now and then pre COVID. But um, yeah, and I mean, the idea for the Oka workshops is just to have the space where you can experiment and you can try different things. And if a kid wants to mix up a leaf with it, then I'm you know, more than happy for them to do it. Uh, but yeah, inspired by the viral from if you have people put your details on to our WhatsApp group if you have any, if there's any groups yeah, that are joining. No, I'm happy. I do, yeah, for adults and kids. All right. Good. Just one more. I must. I really want to. Uh, when are we doing our next public yeah. workshop? Yeah, and I want to I want to do one as well where we can walk around this and actually see the these artists, you know, because they're quite unassuming. Um, the, some of them. And... So, but I'm hoping I'll definitely have one that will advertise in in the year. But if you get a group together, we can just do it at Origins, even for a small group. Okay. Um, I'm happy to run any time. See whether we can get a ESSA group together. Yeah. Just as a heads up, guys, uh, Tammy and I met because I went to one of the Origins talks on Friday afternoon. And um, certainly now that I'm back in the area, I'm hoping to do a whole bunch more. And uh, so get onto the the origins mailing list. It really is a fantastic center. Okay. All right.